Come join us today for our relaunch of EPP's It's a Match. Today we have with us member of the European Parliament from our member party, Sadie and Vey, Tom von den Kendelera. So just so everyone is aware of the rules, we have uh, regular foosball, uh, but such that if Tom von den Kendelera scores, then I get to ask him uh, uh, a serious question. If I score, on the other hand, I ask him a fun question. So that's basically the rules. Yes. And we'll see. I don't know if we're, either one of us is very good at this, but it's the season of football, so uh, and the season of politics always. So, so here we go. Let's see. So here we go. Ah. <laughs> so, um, you're an active member of the EPP, EPP's working group on foreign policy. Uh, this is our, our working group chaired by our secretary general. What's this group been doing and what's on the agenda for the next few weeks or months? Well, obviously, this group is, is about everything that is going on in the world. I think we've been spending a great deal of time on, on China and Russia lately, rightfully so, because they're our biggest competitors, both economically but also strategically. But I'm focusing pretty much on everything security and defense related. Uh, we're ahead of huge challenges, mm -hmm. naming these two countries, obviously, but, uh, but many, many others, many more. And um, trying to get the European Union ready to better defend itself in the future, I think that's the task at hand. And that's what we've been doing there. And it was just the NATO conference a few days ago. Do you have any, any takeaways from that, from that meeting? Uh, well, I'm really happy that the conference was successful, that the summit was a place where people were able to physically meet again, because it was all about mm. confidence building. You know, after the four years of, of Donald Trump, I think it was necessary for us Europeans to sit together with an American that wouldn't be shouting at us and that would be communicating normally uh, in diplomatic terms uh, the fact of finding confidence mm. again in this in this relationship means that we can also uh, you know look at our adversaries in, in a better way and I think in the first place there um, to uh, I think about our strategy towards China uh, hybrid threats as well and obviously ongoing uh, issues uh, around the world uh, conflicts uh, not to name uh, the Middle East but but other regions mm. as well uh, the phrase that comes to mind is building back better which President Biden has been using domestically, but also in the context of the transatlantic relationship, but also in security and defense, I think that makes sense. Building back better together, yes. stronger security and defense. Sure. It was, it was kind of along the way we lost the trust in each other, perhaps, um, with, the, with the previous uh, U.S. president. Yet, at the same time, you can see that our uh, well, adversaries, uh, such as China, such as Russia, are, are really questioning the international rules-based order. Um, are attacking us in all kinds of, of, of ways and we simply aren't ready enough yet to be able to, to defend ourselves uh, to that. And, and I'm mm -hmm. speaking both for NATO as for the EU. We need to get ready really for, uh, for the, the, the few next decades to come where it's going to get probably uh, even more nasty than it is already now. Um, and we need to see who are our real partners and with whom we can work together. And I think uh, the US is definitely part of these. Speaking of strong defense, I need to do uh, some better work on that oh. in that area. So here we go again. A malfunctioning uh, stick here. Uh, oh, it's an ongo. I think in the case of an ongo, I think I get to ask you uh, one of each. So. This is a typically Belgian <laughs> game. Uh, I can see. This a few days ago, sadly, we noted the fifth anniversary of the Brexit referendum. <laughs> to leave the to leave the European Union. What yeah. lessons can the EU learn from the UK's decision? That's uh, probably a, a, an almost as difficult question as this game here. Um, I think seriously, we uh, we need we need to learn lessons from the fact that uh, a, a population decides to want to leave the European Union. We we never expected that to happen beforehand, um, but we indeed came to the situation where it actually happened. Ever since ever since Brexit, I think our relationship now is a bit on shaky grounds. Um, we do have a deal, and, and thank God for that. Uh, speaking as a Belgian, as a Flemish, mm -hmm. uh, trade is very important for us, so that deal was very important. But um, the question is, to what extent that deal is today being, being respected? I'm thinking in particular of the situation in Northern Ireland, which is, which is worrying mm -hmm. to me as well. We've always had peace there, and it would be you know, unthinkable to, uh, to see the situation developing again in, in, in a bad way. So I'm, I'm hoping um, we can find, we can come back to common grounds uh, there. In general, I mean, I'm quite happy to see that perhaps a lot of people that were thinking about exiting the European Union have now, uh, 
have now hidden again their plans uh, after seeing what, what Brexit has, has been. Because all in all, it has been a very unfortunate uh, five years of negotiations, difficult years of negotiations. We're not yet able to see the full results, I think, of, of, mm. uh, of the effects of Brexit. Um, but to say that it has been a success, I, I mean, I would stay away from, from that. On the contrary, even it has been a very unfortunate event for all of us in the European Union. And uh, um, I think lesson, this is the lessons that we've learned from it. Never, mm -hmm. never allow a country anymore to, to, um, to, to get so far as to, uh, as to the, the point where a population decides to want to leave the European Union. This is what we need to learn from. And for example, for the conference on the future of, of Europe, this is, mm -hmm. this is, I think, key. This is where they need to reflect on and, and, and uh, think about ways in which, um, you know, people start to appreciate more what is happening in the European Union. So this is, the, the for anyone who doesn't know, the, the, the conference on the future of Europe where all across the European Union, citizens at local, regional, national level, at European level are working together to think about new ideas, right? Uh, exactly. Think about how the future of the European Union should look like. Um, politicians always say, you know, people should be more involved. Well, this is the time to get involved mm -hmm. and this is the time to have your voice heard. And this is exactly where also we need to learn lessons, draw lessons from what has happened in the past, such as, uh, mm -hmm. such as Brexit, which was, uh, which was really unfortunate. Well, I think that uh, calls for, this calls for, uh, just because it's my prerogative, a fun question. So, well, a personal question. How did you first get into politics? Who? Uh, I was actually studying in the United Kingdom um, when Belgium was suffering its worst crisis in, uh, in, in recent times. I mean, we have uh, the world record now in, uh, in forming governments. Uh, and that mm -hmm. was one of these periods where really it was a, a bad situation. People kept asking me questions about what is happening in Belgium. Why, why are you guys not managing to find a government? Um, and that's when I, uh, when I looked at the European, uh, at the Belgian political parties, when I decided I wanted to, to try and contribute uh, to solving the mess that we are in as a country. And when I came home, I, uh, I bought a party membership card of CDNV. And I said, you know, uh, let's try this. Nathan's defense is pretty poor. Oh, I think that's another case in which I get to ask you one of each uh, a more a more political and a more informal question. What is next generation EU exactly, and how can it benefit Belgium? That's a very important and timely question to ask, I think. It's, um, it's, I think, our economic vaccine that we all needed after this COVID crisis. I mean, we all had a personal vaccine to get better, to get in, uh, in good health again. But um, the next generation EU really, for me, is about the economic vaccine to get us going again as European member states. I think we've all tremendously suffered from, from uh, let's be honest, uh, a year in standstill or even two years in standstill. And the fact that we can now really go at it again, I think that's, um, that's what we really needed. For me, it's about, well, something fundamentally European, where for the first time we're going to be able to raise money on the capital markets. That's a unique thing, let's be honest. Um, all, all together. All together, that's the 27 it, as a European club. You know, that's, that's quite unseen. And that's, for me, a next step into our European integration story as well. Um, at the same time, it obliges countries not just to spend the money on, on, on everything, but to spend it really mm -hmm. on, uh, on sustainable development measures as well as on digitalization. And those are the two things which obviously are, mm -hmm. are crucial for us. So for Belgium, it's about 5.9 billion uh, euros and we'll finally be having uh, some very important public mm -hmm. investments for which we badly needed this, uh, this money. So all in all, I'm, uh, I'm really happy about uh, the money coming our way, mm. obviously, but also about the, the rationale behind it, both from a European viewpoint as well as from a, a policy uh, agenda mm. viewpoint. And this summer is sort of the first concrete step and then many steps to follow, right? Yes. Uh, with targets and disbursements to follow. Uh... That's the thing. So we've been able, uh, quite a unique thing for Belgium, we've been able to come up with one joint plan in which all regions uh, have, have uh, put their plans together um, so the money is coming our way and this summer already indeed uh, the European Union will be disbursing mm -hmm. the, the money in the direction of the member states. I really hope it's going to be spent well at least 
when I can speak for Belgium, I'm, I'm very happy about the level of ambition of the plans, about the way in which as well, this is really, um, yeah, investments for the future, which we need. So here, here's the more personal question. So, and it's relevant to, so you're talking about next generation EU benefiting Belgium. Uh, do you have a favorite aspect of Flemish cuisine? You're, you're from Flanders, representing a Flemish constituency. Do you have a favorite, you know, music, sports, architecture, art? Well, you mentioned already, actually, cuisine is, is, is my favorite aspect about, about, um, about Belgium, about Flanders as well. Why? Because we're very much into, you know, uh, good living, I would say. In general, we enjoy life. We enjoy good food, good drinks. Uh, we have a long brewer's tradition. So uh, anywhere, really, you can find, you can find good, good, good uh, craft beer. But um, more recently, we've been, we've been pretty good at, at making wine. Um, and that's really, for me, the, the most recent discovery, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, even in my, my home region, West Flanders, where we have a lot of agriculture traditionally, uh, winemakers are coming out as mushrooms out of the, of the, of the ground. And, and that's, that's something which I'm fundamentally enjoying because it also kind of proves that people are thinking about, you know, how to prepare for the future. All right, so neck and neck. I think uh, one, it's, it's tight, ex extra tight, time. Tight. Extra time you have just um, few, almost at the finish here. So let me see if I can, if I can catch up. You t you this is the cocktail again. All right, so so now I have to ask you a, a more. So you, I, I think you've just won the game, and, and and so we'll ask you. I'll ask you one more. Let's say serious. One more uh, fun question to, to finish things off. So in the last few days, we've seen very serious concern, and you've expressed very ser serious concern on your Twitter feed, for example, about rule of law across the European Union. This is something which has been an issue for months, let's say, or, or for even years, but especially in recent days. Uh, what exactly is the issue here, in particular with regards to Hungary, and what is at stake? Mm -hmm. Rule of law, really, for me, is the cornerstone of being European. It's about, it's, it's a fundamental principle uh, when it comes to our European Union being together, as it is today. And what you can see um, in Hungary, uh, is that slowly but surely uh, elements are, uh, I would say, entering into society which make, which, which make that we need to ask questions about the state of rule of law in Hungary. If recently I heard about this uh, anti-LGBTIQ legislation that would come in place, that would effectively you know, cut off a part of society from, from, let's say, being part of that society and from, from being protected uh, in it with its fundamental rights, um, then we do have serious questions to ask, and then I think it is it is uh, for us politicians necessary to to uh, to push the emergency button. You know, our Congress coming up, the EP Congress in November in Rotterdam, is is going to be focused on values, the values that ground the political family and, the, and that should ground the European Union as well. So, very very pertinent discussion uh, also within the EPP. Uh, as, as we look forward to the Congress in the next few months? You know, we have been recovering from war. Let's say that was the first uh, Europe 1.0. Then we have had enormous trade, thanks to the single market, Europe 2.0. But here comes Europe 3.0. What do we have in common and what is the future that we want to have in common? And it's all about the values we share and defining those values. If we're not able to define what we, what we share, what we have in common, then we're bound at some point to fall apart. And this is exactly what we now have to prevent from happening, especially with uh, competitors looming uh, around the corner. So the one, fun one final question for you, randomly, uh, let's see here, and that is the simple question. Well, you've, you've touched on it before, but maybe we could explore it a little bit more. Why should people visit your constituency? Oh, um, because we're, I would say, uh, first of all, the gateway to Europe. Everyone who is coming from abroad, um, I think, needs to pay a visit to, uh, to Belgium. If not for, for Bruges or Ghent or Antwerp or Brussels, um, it is definitely for, for those smaller cities uh, that, that do mm -hmm. have a medieval, uh, that do give a medieval impression. But as I said earlier on, it's about uh, not only those small medieval cities, it's also about uh, enjoying life, uh, having good food, uh, seeing the beach, uh, mm. meeting people. Uh, I think we're very much an open-minded country, an open-minded uh, people as well. 
um, and of course to come and see the cycling because that's mm. one of our national sports next to uh, next to football. I've always enjoyed my time uh, in Flanders and West Flanders and all over the country. So. Uh, people should visit, indeed. So, exactly. Tom von Kendalera, thanks so much for joining us for this edition of EPP's uh, at It's a Match.